The first thing is you want to teach your children to speak up for themselves and on behalf of others. And I know I had a, a question that came in also very recently uh, about this, about how to encourage children or motivate children to speak up, especially in the context of so much kind of anti-Asian sentiment that we've seen uh, recently and other forms of hate speech. Uh, teaching your children to speak up for themselves and other people begins with a foundation, a consistent foundation of physical and emotional safety. So when we look at research in general and we see where people did not feel empowered to disrupt a conversation that was negative or where they felt it was something was being said that was wrong, that something that was being said was biased or unjust, um, often people don't feel physically or emotionally safe enough. That's what the, the researcher data shows. They didn't feel physically or emotionally safe enough to be able to speak in that moment. And so this is just an underlying, um, you know, like I said, foundational uh, platform that we need to be building from where your children, you know, are being raised in safe environments where they are being taught and instructed and shown on a consistent basis that their opinion matters, that they are empowered to speak up, uh, you know, where they have, where they disagree, speak up, dis dis uh, speak up respectfully, where they have differing opinions. Um, the other thing that's really important here is that you, as the parent, are going to need to model a wide range of responses so that your children have specific behaviors that they can reference. Um, so, and, and why I'm saying a wide range of emotional responses is because uh, in reality, you know, sometimes there are situations where you can deflect. If you have also, you know, the social sophistication or charisma, you can use humor to disrupt or deflect or to interrupt a conversation that's going in a negative direction. Sometimes there might need to be an institutional level or policy level change that you may need to initiate. Sometimes you might actually have to be loud and more assertive or more bold and more aggressive. So there's a whole range of responses that are, are appropriate at different times. And it's going to be up to you to work on developing that assertion within yourself because your children are going to learn from how it is that you're interacting with other people. Um, the second way that we need to teach our children to leverage their privilege is to teach them about their moral obligation to make the most of themselves by finding and pursuing their own unique purpose with passion. Um, because really, wherever you have privileges, again, you have a moral obligation to make the very most of yourself and to pursue what is going to uh, make you happy in life and what you can do uh, that will also be in service to humanity and other people. And this starts with radically unconditional self-love. Um, because I think so often, people are confused or, or, you know, kind of learn indirectly that um, self-worth is relative and that's not true. Privilege is relative, but self-worth is not. Each child needs to be taught that they have an intrinsic value that is not relative to other people. And I think that, uh, you know, as I've done this work over many years, I see that oftentimes the under, one of the major underlying themes to people's bias is that they really feel like they don't have an intrinsic value, that their value is only relative to another group that they can um, you know, oppress, uh, you know, in some sort of way to kind of give themselves a higher social standing. So we want to make sure that our children are free from this, you know, default internalized um, uh, narrative and that they know that they are already automatically have value and worth and capacity that isn't about, you know, their relative position because of their race or their class or their gender or their religion to other people. Uh, the third thing is that we want to give our children authentic immersive experiences to become participant observers in realities that are different from their own. And this is actually a prerequisite to conversations about social injustice. So what I mean is before you start talking about the different kinds of you know, current events of social injustice, um, it is not appropriate it's not going to be developmentally appropriate. It's not going to be um, productive in the way that you hope if your children don't already own multiple narratives about the group that's being marginalized or oppressed that you're talking about in that current event. So, you know, very specifically, I could say if your children don't own multiple, a variety of narratives about, you know, the African American experience or the Black experience here within the United States and in other parts of the world, um, it's probably not going to be uh, as productive as you would like to talk about something like, you know, the George Floyd uh, um, you know, murder, because 
they don't have enough context to actually humanize uh, um, George Floyd and or black people in general who are experiencing social injustice. So that's one example, but it goes for all range of people. You know, I have a couple of different uh, narratives in some of my books where I talk about kind of the uh, range of stories and experiences that I share with my daughter about people that are close to our family who are Jewish prior to introducing conversation about the Holocaust. Um, but what does this mean? It's going to take an investment to give your children these authentic and immersive experiences. Um, but it goes back to what's the vision of the world that you actually believe in? Because it might require that you have to put your child on a softball team, you know, across town or some someplace away where it's going to be inconvenient, um, you know, on a on a shorter kind of time frame for you to execute on this. But if this is something that you really believe in and that you're making a central value, then that you're going to find the will to execute on that. And I, I also will connect this to a question that I had about um, different kinds of books. We can't always give our child every single kind of experience or access or exposure to every single kind of person. So there are definitely lots of books and different kinds of uh, literature or you know film, different kinds of ways of exposing our children to realities different than their own. Um, I have also a review of books for uh, Black History Month on my YouTube channel that you can access. Um, but I think one of the main emphasis or takeaway points for that is that they shouldn't all just be narratives about social justice or civil rights. I mean, I think I have a book that's about a little black girl who's a cowgirl. And, and again, it's about being able to find the humanity, the common humanity and that relatability for your children. Uh, fourth, kind of related to that, you want to train your young children in particular to first seek to identify with others. So, you know, this starts as simply as I, I know when my children were in school, you know, I'd say, oh, wow, look, you have red shoes and he has red shoes. Oh, wow, look, he likes Pokemon, you like Pokemon. It's simple ways of pointing out because you're training your child how to think, especially when they see somebody who, you know, physically might be different from them, but you're training them to be focused on where the commonalities lie, where they can scan in their mind and in their brain, that will become their habit is scanning for commonality rather than scanning for difference. And so I would implore you to choose to model curiosity rather than judgment in your interpersonal interactions to teach your children to be humble and compassionate. So, you know, you, and rather than um, judging, if you see somebody who's wearing some sort of head wrap, a hijab that's different than yours, you might just say, oh, wow, that's a beautiful hijab. I wonder why she's wearing that. I wonder what that represents to her. I wonder what that means to her. So again, so much of this is going to be about how we're modeling for our children to teach them how to think and act and behave critically and compassionately. Uh, the fifth one is helping your children to develop an organized and or to, to develop the skills to organize community resources to address the social and environmental justice issues that they're passionate about. And this relates to a question that I had about getting older kids engaged. You need to get them engaged um, through authentically aligned interests. So whatever your child is into, you know, if your child is into sports, there are opportunities for your child to reach out and organize and make an impact through sports. I, I love sports and that's why we have a sports foundation um, because that is a, an authentically aligned pathway for me to make a difference. And so that's what I encourage you to do with your children that are older as they are starting to understand more about themselves, what they're interested in, they're artists, they're musicians, there are pathways and opportunities through their own gifts and talents to be able to organize and address issues that are, are um, compelling to them. And then finally, um, this one's uh, you know, also very important. You want creating opportunities for others to be part of your family culture. You know, there's this great quote by MLK Jr. Uh, about lifting yourself up by your bootstraps. And he says, you know, I believe we ought to do all we can and seek to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself up by his own bootstraps. Um, so definitely uh, people from certain communities are not experiencing or do not have access to the same level of opportunity uh, or options as you know some of us are in, who are in privileged uh, positions. So you need to ask yourself, how often are we giving people opportunities that they can grow into? And again, 
modeling that for your children, letting them know that that is part of a value. I would say that in my own lived experience, I have benefited so much from people who gave me opportunities, um, or who took a chance on me, who gave me opportunities, um, you know, leverage the privilege that they had, the social standing they had, the professional standing that they had to give me a chance. It made a big difference in my life. And this is one of the most important and kind of relatively simple ways that we can leverage privilege um, on behalf of other people.